Most of us don't work in a new startup on greenfield projects very often. We're much more likely to be working on software and teams that have already established practices and boundaries that shape how we work. So if we want to start on the journey of improving how we work in the ways that we often talk about on this channel, how do we do that when we aren't starting from scratch? Hi, I'm Dave Farley of Continuous Delivery. Welcome to my channel. And if you haven't been here before, please do hit subscribe. And if you enjoy the content today, hit like as well. I'd like to thank our sponsors, Equal Experts, Octopus, Tricentis, Transfig, and Launch Darkly. They all support our channel, so please do support them in turn by checking out the links in the description below. Some of the core techniques necessary to start you down the road to more efficient ways of working are described in detail in my new training course. The outcome focus that I describe in this episode is at the heart of my approach and described in detail in this great new course. So if you're interested in learning more, do check it out. There's a link in the description below this video. So if we don't usually get to start from the beginning, then the route to improvement is always going to mean changing what's already there, whether that is code, architecture, team structure, or development process. Change is nearly always in the context of what's already in place. This makes things a lot more complicated. So where and how do you begin? What are the things that you need to do to do a good job? And how do you begin to improve things in the messy reality of where you already are? rather than the more idealistic starting point of a brand new project. The first thing to say is that if you can start introducing new ideas and approaches with a new project, it's the easiest time to do it. So take the chance if it presents itself. But that's not our focus for today. So where and how do we start? I think that the focus should be first and foremost on building better software faster. Because if you are good at that, you can fix almost anything else. Obviously, the value of your products to your users is what really matters most. But if you're building worse software slower, you're not going to get to that value sooner. Cutting corners on quality is no shortcut to delivery. We can concentrate on building simple things first, but we build those simple things efficiently and with quality. In general terms, one of the common missteps is to try to do too many things at once and then waiting until you have the perfect answer before starting to make the actual change. This stuff is messy. There are no perfect answers. But the good news is that there are better answers. And the trick is how to seek them out. I think that changing any team or organisation is an extremely difficult thing to do. I also think that is much, it's a much bigger problem than really knowing what the right thing to do is. The difficulty with changing things is really the problem of getting everyone to agree. If everyone agrees, change is usually pretty simple. If they don't, it's going to be hard, if not impossible. As a result of this, I think that change is usually pretty slow because it's not about the technicalities, it's about helping people to find ways to adapt. One of the best ways to do this is to try and make progress or otherwise easy to see. These days I've started to think of this in terms of fitness functions. We need something that tells us after each small step whether we have done, whether whatever it is that we've done has moved us closer to or further from our target, whatever that might be. There are two problems here. One is figuring out what that target is. And the second is figuring out how we measure if we're closer to it or further from it. The mistake that most organisations make when trying to adopt measures is to measure what's easy to measure rather than what's important to measure. The horrible lure is to measure the steps in or side effects of our process rather than the impacts that we're actually trying to achieve. Good measurements do two things. They keep us honest in that they make sure that we're getting closer to our goals and they help us to bring other people along with us. 
Two things that we can use to help measure in this category that are generically useful are stability and throughput, which measure the quality of our work and the efficiency with which we can do work of that quality. These aren't perfect and aren't enough on their own, but they are the only measures that I know of that have evidence that good scores here predict good outcomes from a commercial, technical and cultural perspective. I think that it is sensible to always be a little bit sceptical about your measures. What matters in the end is hitting the goal, not good scores. But having something that tells us if we are closer or further from our goal is really a vitally important tool. Once we have a fitness function like this, we can begin to use it. To check our ideas, to make the best use of it though, we need to check it often. This is much more like using the speedometer in your car rather than waiting to win some kind of medal of recognition at the end. We need to be checking our progress frequently to see if we're staying on the path in the direction of our goal. That means that we need to divide work up into smaller pieces. The biggest mistake that most organisations make as far as I can see is to try to make progress in steps that are much too big. This is riskier and limits the availability of real useful feedback. The smaller the steps you take, the more frequent and clearer the feedback that you can get. Making it a simple change, committing it and getting a pass or fail in a few minutes or seconds is a very different experience to getting a bug report back from the QA team weeks or months after you made the change. Everyone would prefer the first case if all else was equal. So our aim then is to see if we can figure out how to make all else equal and optimise for that. The speed of feedback is a vital measure of the effectiveness as well as the efficiency of our dev process. So we can work to optimise for fast feedback using it as a fitness function for driving changes to our development process by driving for shorter feedback cycles. We're already measuring the most important aspects of this if we're tracking stability and throughput. Throughput is measured by lead time and release frequency. So our job is to reduce lead time and increase the frequency of release. If you're releasing once every six months, then what is it that stops you releasing once every three months instead? Identify those things and come up with a plan to fix them. Whatever it is that stops you from releasing more often, figure out what you could do to make those things quicker and more efficient. For most organisations, there are two common barriers to going faster at this scale. Organisational bureaucracy and pre-release manual testing. Ultimately, as you progress down this path, you're going to want to eliminate reliance on manual regression testing. Whether you decide to fix that now or fix it later is entirely up to you, but the point at which you decide to do this is a liberating step and will represent a significant step in the direction of your ultimate goal of being able to generate better software faster. I recommend replacing manual regression testing with automated testing, but the goal here at this point, however you choose to achieve it, is to reduce the cost in time of pre-release testing without reducing the quality of your output. There is no value in saving time at the expense of spending more time fixing bugs. We want to have our cake and eat it here. Automation is the best answer to this, but if your team isn't ready for that step yet, then look carefully as to how to optimise to at least reduce the inefficiencies. If you aren't already, consider selective testing maybe, or perhaps look at partial automation that gives testers tools to make it easier for them to get to the point where they want to test more, more easily. Invest a bit of time and effort to understand how this part of the process works and maybe use some tactical automation to speed it up. See if you can spot any ways to reduce time and waste in the process and work to eliminate them or reduce them. One idea that is crucial to reducing load on manual testing is to find bugs sooner. Get the people testing the code earlier in the process. Get testers working alongside developers as the code is being developed so that they can spot problems sooner rather than acting as gatekeepers downstream after the development is assumed to be finished. 
get developers to start doing more of their own testing. We need to test our own code as we write it, because ultimately you can't inspect quality into a product. You have to build it in. So if someone else spots a mistake in the code that you wrote, then that's too late. The most effective way to work is that you spot your own mistakes. We are never going to be able to do this perfectly, but optimizing to become good at it gets us a long way toward doing a better job. Getting people to change how they work is incredibly difficult. It will take a lot of talking, it, and it doesn't work being dogmatic. This is one of the benefits of having our fitness function. If some change shows that we are moving further from our goal based on our fitness function, it makes it easier to have a less dogmatic discussion about what to do instead. Okay, that didn't work, how about we try this next? Or, I know that you like X, but when we tried X, we went slower. Are much better arguments than Y is better than X based on my personal belief and because somebody important said so. The trouble is that things aren't always that simple. Our measures aren't perfect and people hang on to sometimes irrational beliefs. If someone has spent years working one way and then are challenged to change it, that feels like a personal attack. It's natural for them to become somewhat defensive. Evidence helps in these conversations a bit because it helps to make the conversation a bit less personal. But the real answer is to try and see the problem from their perspective, even if you still think that they're wrong. First, they might be right. And second, even if you still disagree, it may at least make the conversations easier. You don't win people over by proving them wrong, you need to get them thinking. One way that I learned from Linda Rising to do this is to ask the person who is your fiercest critic or objects the most to the changes that you're trying to make to be the official opposition to help everyone by pointing out the flaws in your ideas. This is useful and shows that this is not about dogma, this is about finding something that works and it tends to win, win over the, the objectors onto your side a little bit more easily. Linda's advice comes from her book, Fearless Change, which I can recommend, which has lots of great strategies to help people cope with change. I think that the speed of feedback is the most effective tool to help us to make progress, as long as you remember that this never comes at the cost of quality. I don't think it is ever a good trade in order to go fast, you must work with high quality. In fact, the reason that I start with speed is because optimising for speed across the board will end up with you increasing quality, because at some point this will be forced on you, because you simply can't go fast if the quality is too low. To see this, you need to start thinking in terms of the whole process and ignore that other big organisation or failing of focusing only on local optimization. This gets us to the second big culprit in terms of the reasons for why we can't release faster. Bureaucracy. One of the main causes of bureaucracy is local optimization. Team A imposes lots of rules on everyone else about how and when they can ask for help in order to protect and optimise the work of Team A. Which is all very nice for Team A, but now everybody else is forced to go slower. This doesn't mean that all bureaucracy is bad and that anarchy should rule. It means that when making decisions like this, we should optimise the whole process and not just part of it. Actually, this is an information processing problem. And we, as a profession, should be pretty good at this kind of thinking. The truth is that the things that work well for software in similar circumstances are equally applicable to teams. So if Team A is too busy to make sensible progress, the common bureaucratic response is to make other teams do more work to slow them down. Or at least do some of the work that Team A would have otherwise had to do. This isn't stupid but it may not be optimal for the whole system. If Team A was Service A rather than Team A, how would we think about fixing this problem? Service A is under too much load, so we could increase the capacity or efficiency of Service A, we could delegate some of the work to someone else, or we could signal upstream with back pressure that Service A was under stress and upstream services 
could reduce the demand. All of these ideas have analogues in the real world of teams rather than services. But the commonest response of increasing the bureaucracy is only one of them. We're delegating some of the work to someone else when we do that. But in this case, we're delegating to our consumers, so we slow them down. In systems terms, this is a valid response, but it isn't the best response. Because now we've slowed everyone down who depends on service A, even when service A is not under too much load. In big organisations, they can grind to a complete halt under the weight of this problem. If Team A only asked us to do the extra work when the load was too high for them, or if we added another team that did that extra work, then fine, we've increased the capacity to do work. But slowing everything down all of the time when the load isn't too high is really a pretty bad strategy. That's a long-winded way of saying optimise for the whole system or process, not just the local effect. Where this ends up when you follow this line of reasoning is lean thinking. We optimise the whole and aim to do the minimum amount of work for the maximum impact by eliminating all of the waste. Everywhere. One tactic to help with this is the same tactic that I'd use for software. Design any bureaucracy to be absolutely minimal and always designed from the perspective of the service consumer rather than the service provider. This is a good place to start when looking for removing waste in the process. Remember, we're trying to remove the bottlenecks that prevent us releasing more frequently. By focusing on removing waste in the process, it's surprising how quickly you will see change very often. One of the common causes of excess bureaucracy and so friction in the process is responsibilities being in the wrong place. This is more common in bigger organisations, but most organisations attempt to improve efficiency by breaking the problem down into a series of smaller steps. This is the right response, but often implemented in the wrong way. And this is a huge cause of friction in organisations. Again, we can think of these in terms of information systems. We can divide work up in sequentially or in parallel. Working in parallel is more complex but much more efficient as long as we don't have to join for some kinds of processes, as long as we don't have to join the information back together again. Working in parallel is more complex and more efficient, but only for some kinds of processes. There are serious limits to parallelism, largely based on whether you need to synchronize the parallel threads with each other or not. Working in sequence is a much easier to understand uh, approach, but also much more coupled. Now, we're only ever as fast as the slowest step in the chain. But it's worse than that. If we divide up this, this sequence of steps and add extra work to achieve the separation, we go slower still. So, we need to be smart in where we draw the boundaries between the steps. In fact, there aren't lots of boundaries that make an awful lot of sense for software development. We nearly always need better collaboration or better isolation, but not both. Most organisations get this wrong. The data says if your team can't make large-scale changes to the design of your system without permission from someone outside the team, then you produce worse results. Equally, if you don't do most of your testing on demand without requiring an integrated test environment with everyone else, you produce worse results again. So, we need to optimise for teams that include all of the skills necessary to make these decisions and work on design, implementation and testing within them, without relying on anyone else. We need to draw the boundaries around our teams to allow for that level of independence and autonomy. You're not going to do this in a single bound in a pre-existing organisation you'll need to start growing teams in small steps to be closer to this shape and help people to learn how to begin to take more autonomy on board. Two good tools to help us to achieve this are to look once again to improving testing. As I've already described, help developers to take more responsibility for testing the code that they write and bring testers into development teams. But the other way is to improve the requirements process. Requirements should not be defining solutions. No programming by remote control allowed. Instead, start moving the requirements process to a healthier place. Requirements should only express user need. 
And it's the responsibility of your development teams to figure out how to solve the problems that, that these needs pose. This move to greater autonomy is the hardest thing for organizations to do. But it's also the best cure for people who doubt the efficiency of this approach because they like working in teams like that too. Thank you very much for watching and if you enjoy my stuff, please do consider supporting our work on this channel by joining our Patreon community. There's a link in the description to that too. Thank you.